Hallelujah. Remember, he says, you know, your fruit is going to remain. Your fruit is going to abide. Hallelujah. So, to train us for that and to equip us for that, I'd like to invite um, uh, Dr. Kurt. Dr. Kurt Olsen comes to us all the way from Wisconsin. And Kurt is here with his, you know, dear wife, uh, Carrie. Can we make them welcome again? Um, uh, thank you very much, sir. You're welcome to uh, teach us and help us to bear more fruit. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. And uh, one hour. Okay. Glory to God. And I would like to start by uh, thanking everyone involved in uh, putting on this conference. Thank you to the host uh, congregation here, to the leaders, to all the, the team that's helping with all the details of putting this on. I know how much work uh, this is. I want to thank you uh, to uh, Brother Wesley and uh, his beautiful wife and just for your commitment to go around the world and uh, empower people to... Um, produce wealth that can be used to finish the Great Commission, to uh, advance the kingdom of God. It's not wealth just for selfish uh, motives, but for godly kingdom motives. And especially, I want to thank the Lord for connecting me with Dr. Ferdinand about seven years ago. Praise God. And uh, we've just, you know, we've just... Um, our hearts have been knit together more and more and more. And it seems like the more we spend time together, the more we just feel like, you know, we, recently I said, I think we were separated at birth. Um, and uh, we're, almost, we're almost twins. We're, our birthdays are very close. Um, I know I look much older than him, and that's the, uh, it's the white hair. Your day is coming, brother. Um, anyway, let's begin with the word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for uh, what you're doing in our lives. I thank you for what you're doing in the world today for the, uh, the paradigm shift that's taking place for the, um, what do we say, that this is a turning point. And uh, Lord, that is true of you. It's what you're doing in the world and you're inviting us to join you in this turning point, in this paradigm shift. I pray that you will... Do your work in each of us, in our heart, in our mind, and in our life, so that we will fully follow and join you in this turning that is taking place in the world and in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, something about a paradigm shift, um, it's, it's not really a paradigm shift until it affects how you live, right? You can spend the next six months watching YouTube videos on diet and exercise, and at the end of six months, be no healthier or thinner than you are right now if you don't put those things into practice, right? You would just have filled your head with knowledge, but not necessarily filled your life with application. Does that make sense? So this thing that we're talking about, you know, I keep talking about disciple making movements, but it's really just taking the church back to the beginning. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, he was talking to 11 disciples and he told those disciples to go make disciples of everyone on earth. And we've been talking about what that means, what that looks like. This morning, I was thinking about how, you know, Jesus said to his disciples, I have much more to tell you, but more than you can now bear. And I was feeling that burden because there's so much in my mind that I want to share this morning. And I have one hour. Um, and uh, not that you can't bear it. We just don't have time <laughs> for me to present it to you. But I want to touch on a few things. Um, Okay, so they put my slides up there. So I want to show you, you know, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. And so I want to show you in uh, picture form what God is doing in the, in the church world today. You know, we've talked about the two different forms of church. There's the uh, building-based, program-based church system that, that really developed about 300 years after Jesus ascended to heaven. 
But before that system, there was the new wine system of Jesus. Sometimes people call that the rabbit church system. So go to slide number five. Just go to the next slide. So sometimes this is an illustration that we use to help people understand these two different forms of church. There's the elephant or the building-based system, and then there's the rabbit system. The rabbit system is much more what we see in the New Testament. It's also um, the only system that works in times of persecution. And I don't know if you know this, but as the last days unfold, persecution is going to increase. When the beast system rises and the Antichrist takes power, the elephant system won't even be allowed to function. And if it does, it's going to be an apostate church. It's not going to be the true church of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, go to the next slide. So, elephants, uh, the elephant type church, it's big, uh, not found in the New Testament, based on a lot of programs uh, pastor centered or you know centered around religious professionals and it has a religious atmosphere uh, a lot of times in the older buildings they have all this stained glass and Carrie and I went downtown and toured some of these old cathedrals and it's you know very holy religious atmosphere um, but it's very very slow to multiply we don't and it says people do get inspired, people do get saved, there's good teaching. These things aren't wrong, but it's very slow to multiply. And it also struggles to make true disciples. And we're going to talk about what a true disciple is today. Uh, Jesus did not say go make Christian church members who most of the time are just passive spectators. Uh, he said, go make disciples. And those are two very different things. A, a Christian church member and a disciple of Jesus Christ are not uh, the same thing. So next slide. Rabbits, on the other hand, are small. They can hide easily. They tend to be our New Testament model and they multiply rapidly. Imagine that you had an elephant and a thousand rabbits standing at the edge of a grassy field and then uh, a hunter stepped out of the woods with his gun and the elephant and the rabbits all took off running which one would the hunter aim at the elephant because the rabbits are suddenly disappeared into the grass you can't even see them so uh, rabbits can hide easily so again in times of persecution and I could tell many stories about that but the church, when it has to go underground, it still functions. It's still powerful. God still works there. Miracles happen. People come to Christ. It's just, we call it the rabbit system. So, next slide. If two rabbits or two elephants fall in love and they decide that they want to multiply, they want to start a family, the female elephant is only fertile four times a year. Only four months out of the year can she even get pregnant. The other 48 months or 48 weeks, um, she, is, she is unable to get uh, pregnant. Did I say four months? Four weeks out of the year she can get pregnant. Like a, a, a female human can get pregnant 12 times a year. You ladies, you, you know that. And then when she does get pregnant, she's pregnant for 22 months. Aren't you glad that you weren't pregnant for 22 months? Right? Oh my goodness, right? Nine months was too much. Um, and then she doesn't even reach sexual maturity till she's 18 years old. So it would, the best you could hope for is that she could have a baby by the time she's uh, 20. It says 21 years there. But so three years from sexual maturity or 21 years from birth, the best you could hope for is... Next slide, that the two elephants could grow to three. That would be 20 years from birth. Something's, I'll have to, <laughs> something's on top of itself there. The, the, but the, maybe, maybe she could be pregnant again. Uh, you know, it, again, if the best you could hope for, 21 years from birth, that the two, babe, two elephants could grow to three and maybe have a, a, a fourth one on the way. That's best case scenario if everything works well now rabbits on the other hand are practically continuously fertile 
Rabbits have seven babies per pregnancy, and they're only pregnant for one month. Now, I used to say, the only time that a female rabbit can't get pregnant is when she's already pregnant. I said that in a training once, and we had a man in the audience, and he was a, a rabbit breeder. And he said, that is not entirely true, sir. I said, what do you mean? He said, rabbits have two uteruses. So a female rabbit can get pregnant when she's already pregnant. Wow. And have seven babies. She's only pregnant for a month, but technically she could have seven babies every two weeks. Wow. And then when those babies are four months old, they can start having babies of their own. Wow. Right? Anybody good at math? Wesley, I bet your brain is already doing the exponential growth. You have an exponential growth um, you know, calculator in your, in your head? I have one on my phone. I don't have it in my head. So in three years, two rabbits can become 476 million. Wow. Right? Now that's assuming that all the babies are female and that there's at least one male around to get them pregnant. But in the kingdom of God, every single one of us is given the ability to have spiritual children. Right? So in a sense, I told you the story about those two days ago about those Muslim ladies who heard the gospel on day one and received Christ, were baptized on day two, finished the training on day three, and began preaching the gospel and planting churches and baptizing people on day four. Those ladies were born into the kingdom already pregnant, spiritually speaking. Do you understand what I'm saying? They already had in their mind the households that they were going to go to, the people they were going to share with, the people they were going to reach. They were already ready to give birth to other kingdom citizens. Does that make sense? Okay, praise the Lord.